Good morning, Regenerate. It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord together. Come on, let's stand to our feet. For those of you watching online, welcome. Worship with us today. Come on, we sing this out. We are here to worship. Come bring your souls. And God's done great things. And he's not done. The sound of heaven come flood the earth. Let the saints rise up as your glory fills the church. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. Yeah, come on. He is always good and his love endures forever. Praise Him all the earth below He is worthy, worthy to praise God All you heavenly hosts Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost He is worthy, worthy to praise God Yeah, come on! Praise God You are worthy, worthy to praise God Well, only you can satisfy 
Silence here, Jesus, Jesus. 
visitors here today. Also, uh, if you are new to watching online or you just caught the stream at Regenerate Online, we want to welcome everyone that's watching on YouTube or on Facebook or now starting today, Instagram live watching right now. Would you put your hands together help me welcome everyone watching live online. Well, we got so many amazing things coming up here at Regenerate uh, that we don't want you to miss. Uh, next week is Communion Sunday. Every first Sunday of the month, we set aside to remember what Jesus has done for us by taking the elements of communion. So make sure you don't miss church next week as we have communion, such an important uh, aspect of our Christian living. Also, in two weeks from today is our church's 11-year church anniversary. And we are going to have a special celebration this day. We are going to be looking at all the great things that God has done over this past year, telling so many stories. And, uh, and then after the service, we're going to have our last after party of the summer. And we're going to go out with a bang and we're going to bring out the TK Burger truck, lots of fun games, some new things that we've added to this upcoming after party. And so we hope that you plan to be with us uh, next week and then the following week for our 11 year anniversary and then plan to hang out after service to continue celebrating what God is doing in our church. So again, that 11 year anniversary is on August 14th. So mark your calendars for that. And there's awesome flyers available. I don't know if you guys caught those flyers yet, but these flyers are epic. And if you don't have one, then you need to have one. Uh, pick one up as a reminder. And then you can pick a stack up if you want to invite some people to come to the 11 year anniversary as well. You can invite people. Uh, I've been inviting tons of people everywhere I go and it's awesome. People are so receptive and are so appreciative of uh, finding out there's a church in their community that they can be invited to. Also coming up this Friday is the first Friday of the month and every first Friday of the month we have our married couples event. And so if you are a married couple, then we want to invite you this upcoming Friday, something a little bit different. It's going to be a date night, married couples out. And so uh, it's your time to get a night out, married couples. And so the married couples are meeting at Bella Terra. You can get dinner at any of the restaurants provided there, and then they're going to be sitting outside. You can get all the information by signing up after service today, getting registered for that, and then you can get the updates for everything taking place for the married couples ministry. You can sign up on the Regenerate app or at our Connect outside the ground level doors after service. And then this Saturday, we got Married Couples Friday, and then this Saturday we have another awesome Our Kids pool party and barbecue. And uh, if you are a parent and you have kids and our kids, uh, and you were at the last one, you know how special and fun it was, and so we want to invite you back. And if you didn't make it to the last one, well, then this is your opportunity to make up for your last absence. And so we want to invite you to come to the next our kids. It's a family barbecue. That is, it's not something you drop your kids off at. It's a pool party, so make sure you bring your kids swim trunks. But it's something that just the families get together at. 
uh, have fun together, fellowship, community, build and grow in our relationships with one another. And it's just such a fun time to be together. And then also we have our family beach days. Uh, We have two more left for the summer. I can't believe Today is the last day before we get to August, and August is the last last month before the summer is over, and I can't believe summer is going by that quickly. Uh, but we have an awesome family beach days, August 2nd and August 16th on those Tuesdays. You can get all the info for those, locations, times, on the Regenerate Church app or at regeneratechurch.com. And if you want to stay up to date with everything taking place here at Regenerate, make sure you sign up for the Weekly Connect. And that's just our way of emailing you a bulletin of everything that's going on here at Regenerate. And and if you've signed up for the Weekly Connect, you know how helpful that is to make sure you stay apprised of everything taking place at Regenerate. But now during this time, we want to pray for our tithes and our offerings as we prepare our hearts during this next song to give to God. Uh, Your tithes and your offerings are received at the boxes at each of the exits. Or you can give digitally, safely, and securely online at regeneratechurch.com forward slash give. Or if you desire to mail in a physical gift and you're watching online, you can do that as well. Go to regeneratechurch.com forward slash give to get all that information. But we want to now pray as we prepare our own hearts in obedience to what God's called us to do, to give back to him. So would you pray with me? Lord, we just thank you so much that we have this place to come to to study your word, to worship you. That we have this place, Lord, to serve you and to serve each other. That we have this place, Lord, to fellowship with one another. Lord, we just thank you for giving us this church. We thank you that you began this work and that you will accomplish this work. And Lord, we just thank you that you're allowing us to be a part of it. And so, Lord, we understand that we don't give to the church, but we give back to you, and we do that through the church. And so, God, as we prepare our hearts to give to you now, our tithe, our offerings, Lord, we just pray that you would stir within our hearts, Lord, just a cheerfulness and a willingness to do what you've called us to do. And, Lord, we just want to be obedient to you. Lord, after all that you've given to us, how can we not give back to you? And so, Lord, would you take our gifts, our tithes, And would you use them to further your work and to continue to provide for your ministry so that we can step into and be all that you would want us to be. And Lord, we give you all the glory for what you have done. And Lord, we will continue to give you all the glory for what you're going to continue to do. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people say, amen. Let's all stand together. And why don't you find somebody that you didn't come to church with and welcome them and then we're going to continue in worshiping our Lord. Heaven's 
here today ministering to our hearts and our lives and we set aside this moment the first part of the week the first part of this day to sit at your feet and to hear from you and to meet with you and we thank you lord that you promise where two or more are gathered that you are in our midst and lord that when we draw near to you that you draw near to us lord we thank you for your promise in matthew chapter 5 for those that are brokenhearted, Lord, that 
There's a special closeness that we can experience for those that are going through pain and hurts. And Lord, we thank you for your heart for us that you would give your life willingly, sacrificially lay your life down in order to restore us into a right relationship with you. How great a cost, how great a sacrifice we can never truly understand for God to come in the flesh and to make himself subject to humanity, his own creation. But Lord, you loved us enough to despise the shame for the joy set before you, which was us in relationship with you. Lord, thank you for your love for us. Thank you that you know what's best for us. Thank you that you will always do what's most important and the greatest for us. And Lord, we just surrender our lives to you now. And we look forward to what you would want to show us today from your word. What you would want to speak to us as we're here to meet with you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say, Amen. Aren't you thankful for the presence of the Lord today? Well, today we are continuing in our series, Guided by God. And in this series, we are discovering God's divine direction for our lives. So why don't you be seated? And if you have a Bible with you, here at Regenerate, we love to study the Bible and to know what the Bible has to say for us. It's God's word. And so if you have a Bible, would you take out your Bible and would you turn with me to the book of Exodus? We are studying verse by verse, chapter by chapter through the book of Exodus in this series, Guided by God. And today I want to talk to you a little bit about how it's so important for us to stand up for what is right and what is true in a time in which we are living in where Society will propagate there's no such thing as truth, and we're seeing what is wrong called right and what is right called wrong, how God is intent for us as his followers to stand up for truth and righteousness so that people could see what is true and what is right in our lives. And so I want to share a message with you that I'm calling Currents of Culture, Currents of Culture. And how it's important for us not to give in to the pressures and pulls of the currents of culture, but to stand on the solid foundation that is Christ Jesus. Would you pray with me again? Lord, we ask as we open up your word that you would speak to our lives. That we would see you from the pages of your word, Lord, that we know is true, inspired by you, given to us from you. So that we could know the life that you've created us to live. Lord, we understand that your word is our authority. It's what we base upon our beliefs. And so God, today I pray that you would prepare our hearts and ready our hearts. Lord, that we would be willing to accept your guidance from your word. That, Lord, your word would change our lives. That our lives wouldn't try to change your word. And God, we pray that you would speak to us today as we come with anticipation, as we come with excitement, as we come with readiness to hear from you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Growing up in Southern California, for many of us, we've spent a lot of time at the beach, haven't we? If you're a beach goer, a bodyboarder, surfer, skimboarder, or simply just to lay out in the warm sand... And if you've ever gone in the water in the ocean, then you've quickly found out something that exists that you might not have known before, and that is oceans have currents. Sometimes those currents are called riptides, those undercurrents that can quickly sweep you out to the ocean. So lifeguards are standing watch and being on guard, knowing the signs to look for, for those that are getting swept by those undercurrents, those riptides. But currents are powerful. That's the reality of it. Massive amounts of water all moving in the same direction. A lot of things can dictate currents. A lot of things can cause the ocean to change currents. There's a lot of reasons to currents. But the point of this is there are currents. And if you aren't careful, you can be swept away by the currents. The same is true in our society today. 
There are currents in culture. And if you aren't careful and you don't have that landmark to look for, then you can quickly be taken away from where you were and find yourself somewhere far from where you once were and not even even realizing it. I remember growing up, my brothers and I, we were surfing one morning. We called it Dawn Patrol. You know, you go out before dawn and you, you get the glass off waves and great conditions. And so we were out there early morning before the sun's rising, super foggy morning. You know, it's one of those mornings that you go out and then you turn around and you can't really see the shore behind you. You can hear where the waves are breaking, but you can't quite see where the waves are breaking. It was one of those foggy, marine layer, overcast mornings. And so we were out there for a couple hours together. We just made sure we stayed together to look out for each other. And before we knew it, we saw something in the distance. It wasn't on the shoreline. It was actually in the water. And we couldn't quite make out what it was until we saw the rubies pier, restaurant, lights shining through the fog. Now that took us by surprise because we paddled out in Newport Beach. And now we found ourselves nearing Main Street in Huntington Beach. Little did we know that we, the currents, because we didn't have a landmark, we were taken by the currents down the shoreline all the way through Huntington Beach over a couple hours of time and never even realizing how far we had drifted. Because currents, if you don't have a landmark, there are, it's impossible to perceive them because it's a subtle drift. And so too, in our Christian living, if we aren't careful, the currents of culture can begin to pressure and sway us and pull us from where we need to be because we don't have a landmark. That landmark, of course, is Jesus Christ and the word of God. And if we don't stand upon the word of God, if we don't anchor ourselves to the word of God, then what we can quickly find happening in our lives is we find ourselves far from where we ought to be, far from where we need to be, far from where we should be. And we don't even know oftentimes how to get back because we've drifted so far. You see, the currents in the culture are real. And as culture progressively gets worse and worse, it seems that the church is only ever one or two steps behind the world in morality. You know, we're not as bad as the world, but as the world progressively gets more immoral and immoral, so does the church. And that's why it's so important that we have that landmark, that we base what we believe upon the Bible, that we stand fast upon the truth of God's word as our solid foundation. You see, God wanting his people of Israel to realize this very principle after leading them out of Egypt, which was a type of the world, and before leading them into the promised land, he keeps them at Mount Sinai for one year to prepare them, to teach them for what would be ahead of them. Because the culture in the land of Canaan, that's called the promised land, it was the land of Canaan, was a completely immoral, perverse, debauched culture. I mean, some of the things that were taking place in that culture as culturally acceptable, society's norm, I can't even tell you today because of the mature content of it. Disgusting, sickening things that were practiced in that society as thought of as normal. And now God is about to lead his people into this land to take over this land. To end those practices, but also God knows that as his people goes into this new land, that there is a danger that the culture could impact and change his people. And God not wanting the culture to change his people, but his people to change the culture. Don't you know today that God desires for you not to be changed by the culture, but to change the culture Not to be impacted by society, but to set society apart by the way that you live. And God's desire for his people in that day were to go into the promised land and not be impacted or affected by that culture in that day. And so God spends a year with them at Mount Sinai revealing his heart and some instructions that would help keep them and guide them as God would give his divine direction for them to protect his people from the currents of culture. 
and to prepare them for what he has for them. Not wanting them to be pulled away, swept away by the culture, being their lifeguard, if you will. Watching out for them, knowing the culture, knowing the riptides, knowing the currents. Desiring for them not to be swept away. Gives them some guidelines. Like we have today. Don't go out past the, the wave break without fins on. It's too dangerous. You know, you ever go to the beach and you see someone out in the water and they start to get sucked out by a riptide. You can see it because all the dirty water stirred up and you can see the riptide going out in the water. They're oblivious to it oftentimes, which is often true in our lives when we're caught in a current of culture and being swept away. We're oblivious to it. And you can see the lifeguard watching them, watching them until it gets to a point where he knows they need saving. He calls in the boat. The boat comes in as extra precautions. He grabs his fins, his his red floaty, dives out in the water, begins to swim out and save them. Because if he didn't, most likely that riptide would take them to a point where it would be dangerous for them or even destructive to them. Jesus, our lifeguard, knowing what would happen if they go in there without certain guidelines and parameters in place, says, listen, I want to protect you. I'm watching out for you. And I don't want you to be taken away by the currents of this culture. And so God gives them the Mosaic law. The law of God, which was the Ten Commandments, and then the law of Moses, which was given to Moses by God, that would be the guidelines for his people for that day. It would be for them 3,500 years ago, the rules to live by, the laws of the land. And here in chapter 23... We see that God is dealing with the sins of society, not wanting the culture of his people to be filled with carnality, but desiring for his people to stand strong, not allowing the wickedness to go unchecked in any culture. So let's take a look. Exodus chapter 23, beginning in verse 1. It says, you must not pass along false rumors. This Mosaic law, God says, listen, this is important for you to be a proper representation of me. It's important for you not to spread false rumors. And the same is true for us today, that we shouldn't be people that speak anything that is not true. That means that before we share something, we better make sure it's true. And if it is true, then we need to ask ourselves, is it necessary to share? Two important rules of thumb when it comes to talking about different things. Is it true and is it necessary? And if it doesn't meet those two criteria, then it's better just to keep our mouths shut. That's the reality of it. Because if not, we are in danger of not only spreading false rumors, but simply just gossiping about other people even if it is true. Is it true? And is it necessary? You might say, why is this so important? Because in a time where fact checkers don't really check facts and misinformation is being propagated, it's so important because it's always been and has and always will be God's design for culture, for his people to be a beacon and a light of truth to any society throughout all of time. It is God's design and desire for his people to be an example of and a beacon for truth. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is truth. And if we want to be followers of Jesus, which in the New Testament, the book of Acts, they called called following Jesus the way. If we're going to be on the way, then we need to make sure that we are representing the truth. You see, Jesus is truth. The devil in the Bible is called a liar. And if we are followers of Jesus, then we need to reflect what is true and what is right. And when we associate with and what we reflect will determine the validity of what we speak, whether it's true or not. In other words, we will reflect who our God really is by the way that we live, 
and the words that we speak. Is it true and is it right? Then it goes on to say, you must not cooperate with evil people by lying on the witness stand. Now, as it relates to the courtroom, as it relates to our testimony, that we also always speak the truth. When asked to give an account, to bear witness about something, whether it's in the courtroom or in the church or something, hey, did this happen? Is this true? That we speak the truth, nothing but the truth, the whole truth. So help us God. Because we are to be beacons of truth in a culture that is quickly swept away in lies. Let me say that again. We are meant to be beacons of truth in a culture that's so quickly swept away in lies. God's design for us is to be examples and beacons of truth. Then he goes on to say in verse 2, you must not follow the crowd. <laughs> Interesting. Don't follow the crowd in doing wrong. When you are called to testify in a dispute, do not be swayed by the crowd to twist justice. And do not slant your testimony in favor of a person just because that person is poor. Have you ever used this phrase before? Well, everyone's doing it. Maybe growing up to get out of trouble, you know, when your parents caught you in something that you knew you weren't supposed to do. You try to justify what you were doing by saying, well, everyone was doing it. And then usually if you as a parent hear that from your child or you use that on your parent, you heard this or you use that on your parent as a child, you heard this from your parent. Well, just because everyone was doing it, if everyone jumped off a cliff, would you jump off a cliff too? How many people heard your parents say that growing up? Yeah, exactly. We've all heard it because we've all used that very stupid excuse. Well, the answer to that question, if everyone was jumping off a cliff, would you do it too? The answer simply is yes, you would. The, question, the answer is yes, because throughout the Bible, people are likened to sheep. God calls us sheep. He is our shepherd. We are his sheep. And the reason why God calls us his sheep is because sheep are really known for doing really dumb stuff. That's the reality of it. In 2005, BBC reported that a herd of 1,500 sheep, 1,500, that's a lot of sheep, 1,500 sheep constituting the flocks of 26 families from the town of Gival, had one of those 1,500 sheep jump off a 50-foot cliff. And guess what happened? All other 1,499 sheep jumped off that cliff too. One jumped, the rest followed. And actually, roughly 450 of the 1,500 sheep died. And it goes on to say in the article, the reason that the other 1,150 actually survived the fall, USA Today says, is those who jumped later were saved as the pile got higher and the fall more cushioned. Every single one of them jumped. You think that one would look off that cliff and say, man, all that bloody broken mess down there, that looks pretty bad. <laughs> you know, you, that's class A pastor humor for you. And you think that some of these, these sheep would say, you know what, that, that's foolish. But the reality is, sheep follow other sheep. And when one does something dumb, if everyone's doing it, are you going to do it too? The answer is yes, that's what sheep do. And throughout the Bible, people are likened to sheep because sheep need a shepherd. Sheep really do dumb things without a shepherd. And so too, we as people need a shepherd. We need Jesus. The world needs Jesus. Without Jesus protecting us and guiding us and directing us, we'll find ourselves, well, falling off cliffs. We'll find ourselves doing things that will be damaging and destructing to our lives. That's why it's so important that we don't follow the crowd. If everyone's jumping off a cliff, it says don't go with what everyone is doing. Don't follow the crowd. Don't follow the flow of the currents of culture. You know, people say, well, you know what? I'm just going to go with the flow. I'm just going to go with the flow. No, 
Listen, any dead fish will float with the flow. Don't go with the flow, but we are called to follow Jesus Christ, which oftentimes is counterculture. It's the opposite direction of the flow and the currents of culture. We are called to stand for what is right and what is true as we plant our feet rooted in the solid foundation of the word of God. We are never called to follow the flow of culture or the tides of society. But completely, actually opposite to that, it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. And then it goes on to say in verse 2, watch this, don't copy the behavior and customs of the world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. I'm just going to pause right there for a moment. This is a parenthetical insert. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, the way that you think should change. You need to give God permission to transform your mind. Thinking things that were acceptable or those are things are okay, that's not a big deal or this is the way that I think politically or this is the way that I think practically. Listen, the way that we think should be given authority to God that we would no longer think the way that we think because of the way that we've learned from the world or our parents' influence or whatever it was, but we should simply think according to what God's word says. That should be the filter that we take every thought through because the word of God is true. And whenever we contradict the word of God, the Bible says the word of God is true. Let every man be known as a liar if they contradict the word of God. And that's why it's so important that we base what we believe on the Bible instead of trying to base the Bible on what we believe. We see too many people doing that today in society. Well, this is what I think, and I think this, and I think that, and I think this, and I think that, and, and so you know what? This is what I think, and I'm going I'm to accept these parts of the Bible because that falls in a line with what I believe. And then what we do is we, we develop our own religion. We create our own religion. It's not true Christianity. It's not a biblical Christianity at all. It's our own religion based upon our own thoughts. And oftentimes those thoughts are contrary to what God's word says. And so it says that we need to allow God to transform us into a new person by changing the way that we think. Then, it says, you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Romans chapter one or chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Two things I want us to see from those verses today before we move on. Number one, don't conform. Don't conform. It says, do not be conformed to this world. Have you ever played with Play-Doh? Show of hands, how many of you ever played with Play-Doh? Whether it was for you or for your child or for your grandchild, I still love playing with Play-Doh. It does make your hands smell really, really weird, but it's really fun. My kids love Play-Doh. My youngest still has it outgrown. Really, all my kids still love playing with Play-Doh. And it's fun to play with Play-Doh. Well, that's exactly what this verse is talking about. Play-Doh? Uh-huh, it is. Because when it says, do not be conformed, That word conform literally means to be molded or shaped. Like we would do with clay or with Play-Doh, to to shape. It says, don't allow the culture to shape you. Do not be conformed to the world. The, The word world can be defined this way, the era or times. Do not be shaped or molded by the era or times in which you live in. That's what it's actually saying. Do you understand how it's easy for us to be shaped by the times in which we live in? Oh, you know, we don't live, you know, that's, that, that's you know, so old-fashioned. You know, get with the times, people will say. God is timeless. His truths are timeless. And God's truths don't change. And that's why it's so important that we don't get shaped or molded Fashion designed by the times or the era in which we live in. 
Just because it's acceptable in the times in which we live by society does not mean that it's right before God. We have to understand that today. Because people will ask me questions like this. Well, now that marijuana is legal in California, you think it's okay to smoke weed? No! Just because something's legal doesn't mean that it's right before God. You know, that I actually have a Bible from the 1800s. And when you open the Bible, you know, in the beginning of the Bibles, how they have the different things like the, you know, the family tree and they have the, the you know, the genealogies and they have the, the, the marriage sheet where you, the holy matrimony where you can write that and you put all the family records in your Bible. And people don't really use those in their Bibles anymore, but they've been included still to this day. Well, I have a Bible from the 1800s, this old, old, old Bible. And in those pages, it actually has an abstinence covenant of alcohol. That, that I wouldn't drink anything because in that day, Christians wouldn't drink. It was unheard of, unthought of. And it's just interesting how always Christianity is being shaped by the culture and the times in which we live in. And it should not be. Do not be conformed. The world conducts itself in a worldly way. And we are meant to be different from the world. And if we do everything that the world does, let me ask you a question. What makes you any different from the world other than the words that you speak and going to church on Sunday mornings? We are meant to be different so people can see Jesus in us. So don't be conformed. But number two, be transformed. How are we transformed? That word transformed literally means like we would think of a transformer. It goes from a truck to a robot, it goes something from pretty basic but kind of cool looking to this epic battle bot robot. I mean, that's what a transformer is, and that's what it's meant for us to be as well, to be transformed from something that would be somewhat normal to something that is amazing and useful by God. And how are we to be transformed? By the renewing of your mind. How do I renew my mind? By washing it through the water of God's word that we are to be transformed by reading and allowing God's word to change our minds. And then we will know God's perfect will for our lives and be able to walk in it. It's so important that we don't get swayed, formed, shaped by the currents of culture, but be different because what God's word says is our true litmus test for what is real and what is right. Now it says in verse two, continuing on in verse two, Don't slant your testimony in favor of a person just because that person is poor. For if you come up, or sorry, if you come upon your enemy's ox or donkey, verse 4, that is straight away, take it back to its owner. If you see that the donkey or someone who hates you has collapsed under its load, do not walk by it. Instead, stop and help. Now, when someone does something wrong to you, and we have the opportunity to help them, our natural inclination is normally like, that's what they get. You know what? Karma. Christians don't believe in karma, but oftentimes we'll like karma when it comes to someone cutting us off and then speeding, and then five minutes later we see that they got pulled over by a police officer. That brings us true joy in life, doesn't it? Sometimes there's nothing better than that. You know, you're driving the freeway. What's this idiot doing? Five minutes later, you know, he's in a wreck on the side. That's what he gets. That's what God is saying here. When someone does something wrong to us, even if that person is your enemy and you have the opportunity to help them, do it. Jesus taught this very principle in the New Testament in Luke chapter 6, verse 27. But to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Jesus said that we ought, when we have the opportunity to help those that even do wrong to us, that we should do it. Because the world hates those who hate them. But God will give us the strength and the power to love those who hate us. Write this down. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 15. 1 Thessalonians 5.15, I'll read it to you. It says this, See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Not to pay evil for evil, but to seek to do what is good. 
We ought to be those that look for opportunities to do good to even those who do wrong to us. Then it goes on to say in verse 6, in a lawsuit, you must not deny justice to the poor. Be sure never to charge anyone falsely with evil. Never sentence an innocent or blameless person to death. For I never declare a guilty person to be innocent. And take no bribes, for a bribe makes you ignorant or makes you ignore something that you could clearly see. A bribe makes even a righteous person twist the truth. And you must not oppress foreigners. You know what it's like to be a foreigner. For you yourselves were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. So plant and harvest your crops for six years. But let the land be renewed and lie uncultivated during the seventh year. Then let the poor among you harvest whatever grows on its own. Leave the rest for wild animals to eat. The same applies to your vineyards and olive groves. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but on the seventh day, you must stop working. This gives your ox and your donkey a chance to rest. It also allows your slaves and the foreigners living among you to be refreshed. Pay close attention to all my instructions. You must not call on the name of any of their gods and do not even speak their names. Here we see in verses 6 through 13, God shows his heart for those who are in need. If someone is too poor to lawyer up, justice should still prevail. If someone is poor on the seventh year, listen, don't harvest or cultivate your land. Whatever grows, let it grow and don't take any of that. You live off of what you've gathered for six years and let the poor and needy come in on that seventh year and harvest your land. It's interesting that God at this time institutes a welfare system. That welfare is actually godly and righteous. But notice how God's welfare system works. God always gives the poor opportunity to be provided for if they are willing to work for it. It's interesting that they could come into the field and they could do the work to harvest, which would be a lot of work to gather and glean in the fields. Provision would be made available to them, but they still had to go out and labor and work for their provision. It was free, but it wasn't a handout. A wise model for the welfare system, especially in the day in which we live. People that need help can get it, but are rarely required to apply themselves. In our country today, we have a major problem, if you haven't noticed, when you go to restaurants or places to eat, and there's signs on the door saying, It's closed. They don't have enough people to staff it to keep their restaurant open. And so people are desiring and deciding to stay home because they can get paid more to stay home than they do to go to work. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 10, however, says this, whoever doesn't want to work shouldn't be allowed to eat. God's model is if someone is able to work, then they should. And if someone is in need, is poor, is going through a difficult time, they should be provided for by the people that have excess. But they should still be required to work for that. But God cares for the needy. And then it goes on to say in verse 14, Each year you must celebrate three festivals in my honor. First, celebrate the festival of unleavened bread. For seven days the bread you eat must be made without yeast, just as I had commanded you. Celebrate this festival annually at the appointed time in the early spring in the month of Abib, for that is the anniversary of your departure from Egypt. That's around March, April time. No one may appear before me without an offering. Notice that. Did you see that? Verse 14 through 17. It says, no one may appear before me without an offering. Then it says in verse 16, second, celebrate the festival of harvest when you bring me the first crops of your harvest. Finally, celebrate the festival of the final harvest at the end of the harvest season when you have harvested all the crops from your fields. At these three times each year, every man in Israel must appear before the sovereign, the Lord. Now, there were three festivals or feasts that were meant to be celebrated annually by God's people. 
And in each of these three feasts, it was about getting away for one week period of time to spend time with God three times a year. In a very similar way, it's what is important for us to do in church. It's what we do. It's one of the important purposes for church is to break away from our normal busy schedules just to spend time at the feet of God, to spend time worshiping him. And it says that every time that they came, they came with an offering. Verse 15 says, do not come before me without an offering. Listen, when we come before God, we should never come empty handed. We should come to offer to God. Well, what are we supposed to offer to God? Four things I want to give you today that we should come in our hands prepared to give to God. When we come, we offer God, number one, write this down, our lives. When we come to God, we should give him our lives. Back to Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says that we're urged on the account of God's mercy to offer our bodies a living sacrifice. This is our spiritual service of worship. You see, the very breath in our lungs belongs to God. Our lives are not our own. They were bought with a price, and that price was purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we ought to offer our lives fully devoted to God. That is every aspect of our lives. If you say, I am a Christian, what you are claiming is, I am not my own, I am Christ's. I have surrendered my life to him. I have given him my all. God, use me. Well, how can God use me? Number two, when we come to God, we offer God our finances. Do you know when the wise men came to the babe of Bethlehem, They came bearing gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It's a wise man or a wise woman, a wise person that desires to come to give their gifts to God. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 2 says, On the first day of each week, you should each put aside a portion of the money you have earned. On the first day of the week, that's the day that we come, we should put aside a portion of what God has given to us to give to him. Well, people say, well, why should I give what I've worked for to God? Here's your motivation. When David had it in his heart to build a place of worship, the temple, David went before his people and said, we want to build a place of worship that we as the nation of Israel can come together and to worship God, a place that we can meet with him, a place that God would meet with us at. And I desire to build this place. Well, the people responded generously, and they gave all that was necessary to build this place. And David, reflecting on what the people did in giving generously to God, he says in 1 Chronicles 29, verse 14, he says, But who am I, and who are my people, that we could be able to offer as generously as this? Everything we have has come from you. And we give you only what you first gave us. Here's the motivation in giving to God. Everything that we have, everything that has been given to us, our job, our finances, our homes, everything that we have has been a gift from God. God has given everything to us. And he goes on to say in verse 15, we are here for only a moment, visitors and strangers in the land as our ancestors were before us. Our days on earth are like a passing shadow, gone so soon without a trace. David says this in this prayer of worship to God, everything that we have has been given to us by you. That's our motivation. And then he he reflects on something because this life that we live right now is so short compared to all eternity. It's going to be passing by. We can get so caught up in in what we do with our finances to try to get ahead in this life, and then what? We die and leave it all behind. David realizes this and says, life is so short to get caught up in all the stuff that we try to do with our finances in this life. And then he says in verse 16, O Lord our God, even this material we have gathered to build a temple to honor your holy name, 
comes from you. It all belongs to you. Our motivation to give to God is that God has given us everything that we have. And even the things that we have really hasn't been given to us. It's been loaned to us, if you will, to steward, to take care of, to be responsible for. God has entrusted to us the things that we have. How can I not give it back to him with what he's asked of me? He's blessed us with so much. For what? To hold on to? To keep for myself? Do you know what the world would be like if the Christians just in the United States obeyed God in the area that the Bible calls tithing? According to Christianity Today, this blew me away. If believers in the U.S. gave a minimum of 10% of their income, there would be an additional $165 billion for churches to use. Here's just a few things the church could do with that kind of money. $25 billion could relieve global hunger, starvation, and deaths from preventable diseases in just five years. One of the world's greatest problems, global hunger, starvation, and deaths from preventable diseases, that could be eradicated in just five years. $12 billion could eliminate illiteracy in five years. $15 billion could solve the world's water and sanitation issues, specifically at places in the world where 1 billion people live on less than $1 per day. $1 billion could fully fund all overseas missions work. 100 to 110 billion would still be left over for any additional ministry expansion necessary. Do you catch that? Hunger, starvation, preventable and curable diseases, illiteracy, water, and all missions work would be fully funded, and there would still be an excess of about 100 to 110 billion that could advance the kingdom work of God in the United States. It would impact the world in such a way that it would change the world forever if believers in the United States would simply do what God has called them to do. But according to church development and Christianity Today, tithers make up only 5 to 10% of the normal congregation. Statistically speaking, only 1 to 2 out of 20 people who attend church in the U.S. actually tithe. Tithe means a tenth, that is, they give a tenth of their income to God. 5% of people in the church provide for 100% of the ministry. But here's the amazing thing. According to health research funding, 77% of tithers give more than 10%. Isn't that amazing? People that do desire to give to God not only want to do what God has required of them, but want to give more than the minimum. They say, you know what? I'm not going to give 77% of tithers give more even than 10%. Because giving to God develops within our hearts generosity within our heart and it frees us from greed and selfishness and it makes us more into who God wants us to be. So when we come, we ought to come with gifts for God. Number three, when we come to God, we offer God, number three, our worship. We should come with praise and thanksgiving. Psalm 100 verse two says, serve the Lord with gladness and come into his presence with singing. Psalms 100 verse 4 goes on to say, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Hebrews 13 verse 15 says, Therefore let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God. When we come to church, we should come not to observe or to spectate, but we should come to participate in worship. We participate in worship by singing, by clapping, by participating in in all aspects of the service. We, We come ready to worship God. And sometimes it's not when we feel like it. But usually when we don't feel like it is when we need it the most. You know, I don't really feel like going to church today. You might say, I remember hearing this story, I think I've shared with you in the past, about a man and a woman who woke up and the man just wasn't really feeling it. He just, babe, I know it's Sunday, but I don't really want to go to church. I think I'm just going to stay home. And she said, no, you, you better go to church. He said, no, I really, I'm not going to go. I just, 
I can't go to church today. I just don't feel like it today. Honey, you need to get up, get in the shower, and go to church. And he's like, no, I'm going to stay in bed and just rest today. And she said, this is the last time I'm going to tell you, you're the pastor of the church. You need to get up and go. Sometimes, you know, you might not feel like it, but do you know when you don't feel like it is when it's usually needed the most? That's when the Bible says for us to give a sacrifice of praise and worship to God. Sometimes worship comes naturally and it just flows like, oh, this is my favorite song. I like this one. Yeah, I can worship to this one. And then sometimes it's just like, you know what? This is work. But when it's work, it's also necessary because God will use that in our lives to develop us. We ought to come ready to worship. You see, we should come not to observe or spectate, but to participate. Not because we feel like it, but because God deserves it. And number four, when we come to God, we offer God our service. First Peter chapter four, verse 10, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. The gifts that God gives to us, whatever they may be, the, are the talents entrusted to individual Christians for the good of the whole church. And what God has given to you is supposed to be used by you to serve one another. God has given you something to give to somebody else. Do you know serving in church isn't meant to be done by the minority of people, but it's meant to be done by everybody of the church. God has given everyone in the church a gift to be used to serve one another. And whatever that gift is, it should be exercised to bless each other. But statistically speaking, the national average for the U.S., or in the U.S., for people that serve in church that regularly attend church is 40% of the church. That is 100% of the work in the church is done by 40% of the people. And that's not God's design. Acts chapter 20, verse 28 says, Pay careful attention to yourself and to all of the flock, in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to take care of the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. You see, God has called all his followers to the ministry. You say, I'm called to the ministry? Yes, because the word ministry simply means to serve. The word minister means just simply one who serves. You know, it was in the olden days when, you know, the pastor would be called a minister. You know, my minister. You know, that simply just means one who serves. But God has called us all to serve. We are all called to be ministers. You are called to the ministry. You might not have known that, but there it is. You're called. Mark chapter 10, verse 43 and 44 says, Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be the slave of all. God calls all of his people to some capacity of the ministry. In one capacity or another to to be there to serve each other. So I need your help. I need you to turn to the person next to you right now. And I need you to tell them, you are called to the ministry. And then I want you to turn and tell them back, you are called to the ministry too. Because we are all called, listen, we are all called to serve God with our lives and to serve one another. These four things is how we should come. And that's what the church has been established by God to do, to accomplish a place that we could serve one another, to give to God through the church, to bless each other, to worship God, to serve, to give, and to sacrifice our lives, saying, God, my lives are yours. This was sent to me this week, and I want to close with this. I saw this, and I thought it appropriate to share with you today. It was written by an unknown author from times past. It's an ancient excerpt on church. Ten things are important for us to practice as it relates to church. Number one, to come. It says, never miss church unless it's absolutely necessary. George Washington's pastor said of him, no company ever kept him from church. I love that. This pastor, this unknown author said, George Washington, the President of the United States, 
His pastor said about the president, an important person, that nothing, no company, no obligations, no important person ever kept him from coming to church. Number two, not only does it say to come, but number two, come early. Rushing into church the last minute is not conducive to true worship. How many of you know that to be true? I mean, how many of you have gotten into a fight on the way to church because one of the two people in the marriage was running late? I know what happens. That's why my wife and I, we go to church separately. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But it's true. It's not conducive to true worship because when we're in such a rush, that anxiety and the stress, you know, we come and get to church, you're like, okay, now I've got to worship God. Ah. We're not, in the, not ready to, not in the spirit to. So it says, come early. You know, could you imagine if we like got up 20 minutes early and got to church 15 minutes early and actually got a cup of coffee before church and got to pray with somebody before church? I mean, could you imagine if everyone was in church before the first worship song started? I mean, I, I might have a heart attack backstage. I mean, could you imagine what that would be like when everyone says, I want to come ready to worship God. I want to come ready to give my best to him. I mean, that would be amazing. I mean, just something to pray about. Anyways, it says, number three, come with your whole family. And it goes on to say, the church service is not a convention that a family should merely send a delegate to. <laughs> I think that's true. You, you just go, honey. I'm just going to stay home, honey. You just go to church. You don't represent our whole family. It doesn't work that way. Number four, take a place toward the front of the church. Hmm. Leave the rear seats. This was the instruction in this day. Leave the rear seats for those who may come late. And for backsliders and mothers <laughs> and, <laughs> and mothers with everyone in the background right now. I'm just sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and leave it for mothers with children. So it says, hey, sit in the seats of honor. When you come to church, come sit in the front. Don't be a, a back row believer. You know, leave that for mothers with children that need to sit in the back. And if their baby starts crying, they can slip out and not be a distraction. I mean, leave those seats for them. But come take a place in the front or, or, or the backsliders, because that's who sits in the church, back of the church, the backsliders. That's funny. And then it says, number five, it says, be devout. The church is not a theater or a place for amusement. What the church has become today, by the way a place of entertainment for people to come and spectate. But it says the church is not a theater or a place of amusement. You come to worship God, not to whisper, lounge, or sleep. God's house deserves our very utmost reverence. Number six, help strangers to find and follow the service. If they don't have a Bible, share yours with them. Sing, join in the worship. Don't just sit. Number seven, Always remember that strangers are the guests of the church. It says, treat them with the same courtesy as you would if they should visit you in your own home. I love that. Number eight, give a good offering to God. It says that God loves a cheerful giver. Freely you have received and freely we should give. Number nine, never rush for the door. After the benediction, if you don't know what a benediction means, that's the closing prayer, that's the end of the service. As though the church were on fire, many of you run, but don't. Speak and be spoken to. Be friendly. And I would just add to that, find somebody to encourage. Find somebody to tell them it's great to see you here today. Find someone to pray for. And number 10, never stay away from church because that church is not perfect. Perfect how lonesome you would feel in a perfect church. The church isn't created for perfect people. And if you are a perfect person, you're not welcome here. <laughs> because this place is a place meant for broken people who all acknowledge our need of a savior. How important it is for us to live out our lives in such a way that would honor and glorify God in the way that we come to him. You know, church is this time that we set aside in the busyness of our routine. And listen, I know we all have busy schedules. And even right now you're thinking, man, is he going to wrap this up? Because it's almost time and we got to get going. You know, we have these plans to get to. And Listen, how important it is for us to set aside some time. Weekly, regularly, and can I say consistently. To come together 
to encourage one another. If we look at church as just something that we come to to get something from and then to leave, listen, we'll find ourselves bouncing from one church to another to another to another, trying to find a church that will be able to meet all of our needs and give everything that we need. That's not God's design for the church. No, God's design for the church is for us to be the church. If you see a need, oftentimes people leave because there's a need. Oh, they don't have that. Well, I'm leaving, you know. The regenerate, they don't have a volleyball club, and I like to play volleyball, and until they get a volleyball you know, club, I'm not going to really go there. This other church, they got a volleyball. I've, I've literally been told that before. I don't like volleyball. <laughs> Just kidding, I do. We play that sometimes after service. But listen, church is meant to be a place that we come to give to. Could you imagine the week that you don't come to church, someone that was in need of an encouragement, someone that found themselves discouraged or depressed, and God would give you the eyes to see that person, to minister to them. I'm not the only minister of this church. This church is filled with ministers, but we got to answer the call to the ministry. So as it relates to the culture that we live in, the currents of culture. Listen, I know the currents of culture, what is normal, what's taking place in Christianity. I keep a very close eye on things that are taking place in our own community and what's taking place in other churches. And let me just say, it's a true danger that we need to watch out for, dear brother and sister. It's a true danger what's taking place in cultural Christianity. And can I just say cultural carnal Christianity today? Because people are no longer following the word of God. They're no longer being obedient to what God's called them to do. And they're living some other form of postmodern Christianity that is a version of it, but not truly God's plan for us. And that we would be wise, that we would search the scriptures, and that our lives would truly reflect what the Bible teaches. Because right now, the world is being swept away by the culture. The world is being taken away and they have no landmark. And God's design in our culture today is for us to be, as we are anchored, that solid foundation that people could hook onto us and that we could bring them safely to where Jesus is. Their salvation, their eternity is dependent upon it. May our lives truly reflect Jesus. Would you pray with me? I want to just ask that the Lord would give us wisdom with this today. Father, we pray as your instructions were given to those people in that day, but how it applies to us so real this day. Lord, I pray that you would help us to truly reflect you and what is true. Lord, that our lives would bring honor to you, that we would truly be a right representation of you. For those here today that would call themselves Christian, which simply means a follower of Christ or an imitator of Christ, Lord, I pray that when people see the imitation of you, it would truly reflect you. Help me, help your church, God. Help us, Lord, together. Stand strong for what is right and what is true. As the world is being swept away, Lord, into all sorts of immoral, debauched things. As the world is getting progressively worse and worse, we're told in your word it will. Lord, as in the days of Noah, so it will be. In the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, so it will be. And Lord, we're headed to that if we're not already there. Lord, but in dark times, your light can be more clearly seen. And so, Lord, would your light be shining bright out of our lives? Help us, we pray, to truly represent you in the way that we live. And, Lord, in the way that we come to church, in the way that we make that commitment to serve you, to give to you our lives, our finances, our worship, and the gifts that you've given to us that would benefit each other and to encourage one another, to bless each other and to see each other go forward. Lord, would we be that, your church that you've designed 
and created for us to be. Convict us, Lord, where we need convicting. Correct us where we need correcting so that we could live rightly with you and for you. And with heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe there's some here today that wouldn't call themselves a Christian because you haven't ever yet placed your faith in Jesus Christ. You're not following Jesus with your life. But today you would say, I want to. I want to follow Jesus. Understanding what he has for me is what's best. I want to know that I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. I want to know that I can have eternal life with Christ. I want to be forgiven of my sin. I want to be made right with God. And if that's you here today, or even watching online, it would say, you know what? I want to be made right with Jesus. I want to place my faith in him. I want to enter into a relationship with him. I want to be forgiven. If that's you today, I want to lead you in a very simple prayer of giving your life to Jesus Christ. Would you just bow your heads and believe this in your heart? I'm going to ask the church to surround you in this prayer and pray this out loud. Pray this with me. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Thank you for loving me and dying for me. I give you my life. Take me and use me for your glory. I will follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together. Yeah, we can praise the Lord. If you are one here today that, was, that said, you know what, I made that commitment to follow Jesus Christ. We want to celebrate with you and congratulate you. Even if you're watching online right now and you made that commitment to follow Christ, that's just the best decision of your life. Church, would you back me up when I say that? If you've made that commitment to follow Christ, then you know that to be true. And we want to give you some materials that will help strengthen you in your relationship with God. And so we want to invite you. There's a white canopy outside the ground level doors. If you made a commitment to follow Christ, then stop by that white canopy. They want to give you a packet real briefly, a Bible if you don't have a Bible, and some other materials that will help strengthen you in this journey through life with Jesus. Now, church, it's time for us to be that beacon of hope and light to a world that so desperately needs it. So this week, ask the Lord, Lord, who do you want me to be a light to? And let's start looking for opportunities to talk to people about Jesus. The Bible says that we are all to do the work of an evangelist. Now, evangelism might not be your gifting in the body of Christ, but every minister, every person, every follower of Jesus is to do the work of an evangelist. What is a work of an evangelist? That's just simply telling somebody about what God has done in your life. So I want to encourage you as your pastor today, look for someone to talk to this week about Jesus. Look for someone to invite to church this next Sunday to bring to church with you. Find somebody that you can let them know about the good things that God has done in your life. And then watch what God will do. Let's go be the light to our community. No longer being swept by the currents of culture, but standing strong for what is right, for what is true, and for Jesus Christ, our author and finisher of our faith, our foundation that we build our lives upon when all other ground is sinking sand. On Christ, the rock, our solid rock, we stand. May that be the prayer of our hearts today in Jesus' name. Let's worship the Lord together.
Well, God bless you all. We pray you have a blessed week. For those of you watching online, we'll see you next week. God bless you all.